Hey everybody on YouTube and Zoom, we're just, uh, we'll wait about 60 seconds before we get started. We wanna welcome everybody to the USA Hockey webinar series. Um, so we'll get started shortly. Todger Popkin, uh, Kevin, are you guys ready? Ready to go. Okay, just want to welcome everybody on YouTube Live and as, and also on uh, Zoom for our USA Hockey Coaching Webinar Series presented by BioSteel, BioSteel and Pure Hockey. Um, we got another great guest today, and I, I'm going to send it over to you, Kevin. But just make sure that um, if you have any questions, put it in the Q&A chat, and Dr. Popkin and uh, Kevin Margarucci will be sure to answer those. And then I know Dr. Popkin was talking about putting some stuff, uh, asking questions to the group. So you can put that on the chat. So questions go in the Q&A. Uh, anything, answers that you want to do, put in a chat. But we'll figure it out. And we're excited to have both of you on and everybody else um, part of it. So it's all yours, Kevin. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining again today. Um, I just kind of wanted to segue into today based off uh, kind of piggybacking how we ended yesterday's webinar for those of you who are on. Um, we had Dr. Mike Stewart, who's our chief medical officer yesterday, and he has four um, children who are now all grown adults, and, um, but they, they all grew up playing hockey and they played hockey at the division one level. And one of the questions that came in at the end of the, uh, of the webinar yesterday was um, asking him, you know, with the high level that uh, his three boys played at and his daughter, uh, Division One, and then all his boys played, uh, were drafted and played in the NHL. When did they specialize in sport? And, um, you know, he as a hockey dad and parent, along with his wife, they were really encouraging their kids being multi-sport athletes, building that athleticism and all the things that come from being on different teams. Um, all the benefits you get out of that. So all of his kids were multi-sport athletes all the way through high school um, until they went on the They didn't really stick to hockey as their one sport until they got to the NCAA level. Um, kind of to piggyback on that, um, some of the stats just came out with the NFL draft that just finished up this last uh, weekend. And the data out of there shows that 217 out of 255 athletes that were drafted in the seven rounds of the NFL draft this year, 217 out of those 255 were multi-sport athletes, which is about 85%. Um, and I don't think any round looking at the breakdown had less than 80% in one particular round. So um, this is something that I've, uh, I've taken a lot into as an athletic trainer in my profession and now with my role as a manager of player safety with USA Hockey. Um, and part of my professional organization, the National Athletic Trainers Association, they've really put a lot of time and effort into looking into this topic of early sports specialization. And they came out with an official statement um, with athletic training as a profession. Prevention is one of the key domains that we look at. How do we prevent sports injuries from happening in the first place? Um, obviously, we can't take it down to a zero risk of injury in any sport, but what can we do to prevent injuries? And um, they really had six key points that came out in their, um, in their official statement. And I'm just gonna read those off real quick um, before we get into Dr. Popkin's presentation. And the first one was their recommendations are delay specializing in a single sport as long as possible. Um, not only does this support general fitness and athleticism, you decrease your injury risk and it allows you to participate and sample multiple sports um, you know, throughout growing up. Um, the second thing is play, up, play on one team at a time. Too many times we see kids that are, you know, they have one sport that may be their main sport and they might do that year round, 
and they think they're a multi-sport athlete because they're doing other sports, but they're going from one team to the other in overlapping seasons and not really that increased sports volume puts them at a high risk of injury and, and fatigue and burnout and those types of things. Uh, three is less than eight months per year in one particular organized sports activity. Uh, the fourth one is no more hours per week dedicated to that organized sports than you are age in years, okay? Then the fifth one is every week you should have at least two days of rest and recovery. Um, you know, you can do some things on your own, but getting away from an organized activity a couple days a week. Um, and then six was after your season is over, allow time for rest and recovery before you get into um, another organized sport. Um, and that kind of gives you that um, physical, mental rest, um, promotes overall healthy well being, and also will add to that decreased injury risk and burnout. So now getting into today's webinar, um, you know, we're fortunate to have Dr. Popkin who has dedicated a lot of his um, career as an orthopedic surgeon, looking at um, some of these early sports specialization um, issues. And, you know, he deals with uh, pediatric adolescent and adult sports medicine. Um, he is an associate professor of orthopedic surgery at Columbia University and New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York. Um, he's very passionate about youth sports and dedicated a large amount of his academic efforts, as I said, to treating and prevention, preventing injuries and developing athletes. He's also devoted a lot of time significantly, specifically to the prevention, management, and treatment of injuries in the sport of ice hockey. Um, over the last few years, he's also been a team physician for some of our USA hockey teams um, at the World Championships on the men's side and our U18. Uh, five Nations team. So um, he's got a lot of experience in this area and uh, we look forward to everything that he's about to present to us. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Popkin. Uh, thank you. Can uh, everybody hear me okay? Kevin Caruso, I'm good? Yep. All right. Thank you for the uh, introduction and thanks everybody for uh, spending some time with us uh, this afternoon. Kevin, that was a really nice uh, intro. So uh, I guess to piggyback on that with uh, Doc Stewart and his four kids, you know, Everything he does is excellent. He's our chief medical officer for a reason. So it doesn't surprise me that all of his kids were multi-sport athletes and they were doing it the right way. So listen, this is a, a hot topic uh, in general in youth sports. It's something I'm pretty passionate uh, about. I think there are a lot of myths uh, out there about early sports specialization. And we're gonna go over a lot of that stuff uh, shortly. So in general, you know, I don't think anybody would argue to the benefits of youth sports. You can do fitness, it should be fun. It really helps a lot of social development and it lets you know how to be a part of a team. And uh, additionally, you learn how to work hard and you know, 6 a.m. practices, you learn the importance of uh, being on time. So a lot of important uh, aspects uh, to participating in youth sports. And we're gonna go over what I think is the right way to do it. Um, and I think by the end of the talk, you will uh, understand why I think it makes sense to be a multi-sport athlete uh, until about the high school age or the Bantam level. So uh, listen, we're in the middle of a, a pandemic. Uh, COVID seems to be everywhere. Um, thanks for this uh, invite to participate on the USA Hockey webinar and stay connected in the, uh, the hockey world. I really hope we can see each other uh, soon uh, in the rinks. Uh, and even though Mario Lemieux is Canadian and this is USA Hockey, I, I've always loved his quote, every day is a great day for hockey. And uh, I look forward to being able to watch the sport soon. So. Here's a shot from a youth hockey game. And uh, I always like when I give a talk to just give a, an outline of what I'm gonna go over. So first I'm gonna talk about uh, the professionalization right now that's going on in youth sports. Then we're gonna talk specifically about early sports specialization in ice hockey. I'm gonna go over a bunch of reasons why late specialization is better. And listen, I think a lot of people on this webinar are coaches and parents, and you guys are important. You can make a difference, and I'm going to show you why. And then we're going to leave with some final thoughts and pearls and hopefully answer any questions that you guys may have. So when we look at youth sports, the landscape has significantly changed. Uh, gone are the days of Sandlot uh, baseball. 
I remember growing up uh, in Minnesota, uh, playing baseball all the time with my friends, Mark and Rob and Ben uh, and Jeff, and we'd even get Willie in there uh, from time to time. And now those days of sort of free play where we were making the rules, where the officials are over, now kids are gearing, trying to get ready for the Little League World Series in Williamsburg, where instead of just playing in front of your friends, you're playing in front of thousands. And some people call it the ESPNization of uh, youth sports, where you know they're being broadcast and being watched by millions around the world. Hockey's you know really no different. Um, I think pond hockey and free play on the ice is fading. Um, we've got silver stick tournaments. We've got international tournaments uh, happening at younger and younger ages. So it's affecting hockey too. And in general, uh, and certainly out here in the New York and tri-state area, there is a lot of pressure for kids to excel in anything they do and excel really, really early. Uh, when I look at the sort of mentality of youth sports that has evolved over the last 25 to 30 years, the mentality in general has just completely changed. Uh, gone are the days of uh, Grantland Rice, and for those sports writer fanatics out there, this is who Bill Simmons uh, named the Grantland blog off uh, ESPN for. He was a famous sports writer at the turn of the century. He was originally from uh, Tennessee, coached at Vanderbilt, and then made his name writing a lot about Notre Dame and the Four Horsemen. And he has just a great quote that I always uh, really liked, which is, when the great scribe comes to write against your name, he marks not that you won or lost, but how you play the game. And now, as Kevin was sort of mentioning in the intro, in his time as an ATC, he's seen the culture really change. And I have too. Now that mentality is being replaced by a win at all costs mentality. Here's Vince Lombardi, coach of the Green Bay Packers, who said, you know, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. And then one of my favorite Will Ferrell movies, uh, Talladega Nights. You ain't first, you're last. You know what I'm talking about? That phrase, trademark, not to use you guys as a Ricky Bobby. So in case any of you missed that, that was... Uh, you ain't first, you're last. You know what I'm talking about? And uh, I think that does embody a lot of the current mentality uh, at younger and younger ages. So listen, uh, the days of pond hockey, uh, playing games at your own choosing, where kids are picking the teams, they're making the rules, they're officiating, adults are nowhere to be seen. Those days are, are really gone. Uh, and with that is a lot of free play. You know, the pond hockey is dying out. And even in soccer, like uh, a lot of the street soccer is fading. People aren't playing sandlot baseball. Um, this is not uh, unique to ice hockey. Uh, so what we're seeing is the professionalization of uh, youth sports. Adults are now doing all the organizing. And with this distorted sports landscape, we have so much ultra organization. Travel teams are starting at seven years uh, of age and going everywhere. And what's happening is we're getting a, a split. What parents are initially wanting to get from their kids participating in sports is uh, no longer necessarily in alignment with what the kids wanna get from their participation in the sport. And unfortunately, this shift in mentality has come at a really high price to our kids. What's been the cost of this landscape switch, the change in mentality? We're getting elite and travel teams at an incredibly young age, uh, increasing stress, increasing pressure. And there's been this drive and this push to specialize in sports and hockey's no exception at younger and younger ages. Uh, in the PED sports world, we talk often uh, about the quest for the three T's being uh, trophies, uh, make the travel team and participate in as many tournaments as possible to get exposure to get to the next uh, level. So when we think about the topic and the issue with the dangers and some of the myths of early sports specialization, I think it's important first before we keep talking to define it, what we actually mean when we say it. So Kevin mentioned it a little bit with the uh, NADA intro statement, but essentially early sports specialization is participation or intense training with competition in one organized sport for greater than eight months a year. Second part of the definition is it really during that time period has to be the exclusion of participation in any other sport. And then the final thing, when we mean early, we're talking about ages uh, 12 and under, which is about seventh grade. 
So why specialize early? Why has there been this push? Uh, I think the easy answer is there's a perception that this gives the young athlete a competitive advantage. If you wanted to think about it another way, you're a parent out there, you know, if you got a kid and trying to get them into a good college, just in general, you have them take the pre SAT, they don't do so well, what are you going to do? You want to give them some help, give them an advantage, you sign them up for a Kaplan or a Princeton SAT course. I think most parents, um, gut is actually in the right place. I just think they're getting some bad uh, information. And I'm gonna go over why uh, some of that shift uh, has occurred. Listen, there's nothing wrong with the drive to get better. That's why we're here watching a, a webinar. We all wanna learn, we wanna keep pushing and learning. Uh, but now kids are putting in a, a lot of time at the rank, you know, showcases, elite teams. And uh, one of the first things that I ask an injured athlete when I see them in my office is I have them write down their athletic schedule. And I'm often shocked at how many hours uh, a week they are dedicating to one sport. And so here's actually the good news from this talk and we're all hockey fans here. So a lot of, for a lot of people and a lot of kids, their holy grail is uh, achieving an NCAA scholarship to play hockey. I mean, this is a USA Hockey webinar. So a lot of us dream of one day wearing the red, white and blue, but versus some other sports, listen, this is good news. Hockey actually is a pretty good pathway from high school to the NCAA. So these are the recent numbers. These are from about 2017. So the NCAA looked at basketball, men's and women's, football, baseball, ice hockey, and men's soccer, and looking at percentage of players from high school and how many of them made it to the NCAA. And hockey was almost 11%. So um, yet another reason why hockey is uh, awesome. Uh, but what is really responsible for this mentality shift that we've seen over the last 20 years? Um, one has been a little bit of a misapplication of uh, something called the 10,000 hour rule. It was popularized in Malcolm Gladwell's book called uh, Outliers. And essentially it was a study done in the early nineties where they were trying to tease out, hey, what makes an elite musician? And they looked at a bunch of different factors and it turned out there was a pretty clear correlation. If you had a musician that uh, played more than 10,000 hours, uh, they were elite and anyone that didn't quite get to that number wasn't considered an elite or a master musician. And from that paper, people have applied that 10,000 hour rule, I think incorrectly uh, across a lot of athletic achievements. I certainly think practice is important, but I think it's just a little more complex uh, than that. If you think about it intuitively, and this is why I understand why parents and coaches would buy into this, it does make some sense. Uh, but I just, I'm not sure that um, using a musician as an example in that one study is now justification to start the clock on the 10,000 hours earlier and earlier. One of the other reasons for a shift in our country with the mindset was uh, actually some of the success of the Eastern European countries and the Soviet Union during the 70s and the 80s and the Olympics, particularly the 1976 Montreal Olympics where they, they really cleaned uh, house. Uh, and if you look at the sports that they were dominating in, a lot of them are individual sports, gymnastics, figure skating, and swimming. And as some of those coaches from the East defected to the West, they brought with them a lot of their training strategies. And what they were doing in these Eastern European countries was identifying really talented kids at ages as young as five and six, and basically forcing them into year round training once they were identified as being talented. And some of that mindset combined with the 10,000 hour rule from Gladwell, I think is kind of where we're at. Uh, I'm fortunate to practice at uh, Columbia. Uh, my boss is the uh, team physician for both the New York Yankees and the NYCFC soccer club. And he's uh, dedicated a lot of his time to understanding a little bit more about skill acquisition. He wrote a book called Skill. It's actually a pretty quick uh, read. I, I highly recommend it. And it's pretty relevant for this talk. We all just want to get better and, and Chris delved into that uh, pretty deeply and came up with, I think, some important themes that uh, I'd like to pass along. One, uh, you know, certainly people that are able to and achieve at an elite level have a different relationship with practice uh, than maybe most of us. Um, 
there's a saying, it's not just practice makes perfect, it's perfect practice makes purpose. So again and again. So there may be something with the 10,000 hour rule, but it's a little more complicated than that. The next level to really learn and take your skill to the next set is a concept called chunking. When you do something so much, it becomes almost like second nature. So for us as surgeons, you know, once you've done your 1000th ACL, hopefully most of that procedure is on autopilot and you're not thinking. Similarly, in the world of uh, ice hockey, you know, as a youngster is developing their skills, you know, while initially it may be very hard for them to do backward crossovers before they know it, they're just not even thinking about it and moving on to the next skill uh, that they want to uh, tackle. And then the final thing that really separates people that are able to achieve at a really elite level is the concept of reaching going out of bounds for what you're normally comfortable doing. Because if you never stretch and you never try, you're never really going to improve. So that's my son, Max, and I want him to be really smart. So I had him read Chris's book when he was two. So he would get all those concepts and uh, you know dominate uh, first grade. So, uh, but back to the focus of this, I think one of the downsides to this mentality shift too is we're losing a lot of free play. Free play is important to Ahmad's third point about, uh, you know, basically reaching, trying to improvise, you know, people have uh, equated that to like jazz musicians, you know, like it, you just need some free time to just not be restrained and really test your limits where no one's watching and judging and grading you. And uh, I think that's really what we're missing a lot of. And unfortunately, we're starting to lose a lot of our young hockey players. They're uh, dropping out and quitting because uh, the sport's just not fun anymore. And so if there's a number to sort of take away from the end of my talk, uh, if there is like a one number answer for when it's okay to start specializing in ice hockey, we think it's somewhere between uh, 14 and 15. And if you're able to hold off until then, we think you have a much higher chance of staying emotionally healthy and not burning out on the sport. One of the things we uh, also see a lot at, at Columbia is uh, young kids that are tearing their ACLs, not really on the ice rink, more on the soccer field. Uh, but one of the things that uh, I've taken away from treating a lot of young kids that have torn their ACL is how much their young athletes identity is wrapped up in their sport. So when they're out, you know, recovering for sometimes nine months to even a year, if you're doing a, an ACL on a really young kid, I mean, uh, a lot of their identity, who they identify with as their peers and how they see themselves is wrapped up in their sport. And it can be a pretty big uh, deal. Uh, one of the other dangers in just applying the, hey, let's just get 10,000 hours in before they're 12 years old, you know, uh, young bodies are growing. They've got growth plates. Um, and, you know, when you put them through a college type schedule, you're really increasing their chance for injury. We certainly think you're risking burnout and, uh, you know, lowering the chance of that kid continuing the sport as lifelong doing adult leagues and things like that. One of the other real uh, serious dangers of early sports specialization and particularly in ice hockey is a lot of times it can create a false barrier to participation and eliminate some kids that might otherwise succeed in a more open, uh, almost like European type uh, system. Um, so I want to shift uh, and, and talk, you know, about debunking some of these myths. So we sort of set up the problem. And now I think I want to set up my argument for, you know, like why early sports specialization is not what we should be pushing on our kids. And I'm not just saying that uh, as an experienced guy, the, the literature backs what we're saying too. So first thing, you know, with the holy grail of getting a division one college scholarship is early sports specialization necessary. We looked at a bunch of athletes in the New York area and found out it was uncommon in NCAA Division I athletes and team sports to specialize early. The mean age for the whole study was almost 15. We found that uh, individual sports tended to specialize earlier. And again, we can make a difference as parents, coaches, and physicians uh, armed with better information that you, know, you don't have to uh, specialize before 12 uh, to get a college scholarship at a Division I school. 
And, and then one of the other things that was neat at the end of this study, we sort of asked the kids what was their drive, like, you know, why were they doing this? You know, skill acquisition was up there. And then there's something about intrinsic drive. Like there's some people that just want it more. And no matter how bad you may want it as a parent or a coach, you know, that a lot of it does come from the kid's individual desire to do it. So I would argue that it is a myth that early sports specialization is necessary to get a Division I scholarship. Because this is a hockey webinar, we got to talk about the literature that's relevant to just ice hockey. The group out of uh, Penn State put out a paper, I think about two years ago now, where they surveyed uh, NHL guys at Penn State and then a Division III school in Pittsburgh. And the take home from this is the mean age of everyone that they uh, surveyed for when they decided to specialize in ice hockey is again that magic number that we've been hitting. It's about 14 to you know 15 years of age. Um, just last year, the group uh, in Philly, uh, Rothman, uh, looked at early sports specialization as well. Uh, they did a pretty big survey. They did have some baseball players uh, in it as well. But there are a couple of things I want to highlight here that I think are, are really important. And it gets to Kevin's point, too, with uh, regards to the overall culture shift. When they uh, asked the average age of specialization for the current kids that were playing high school hockey, they answered 12 years of age. For the guys that were in college and pro, it was almost 14 and a half, 15. So Kevin sort of alluded to the change that he's seen over his athletic career. And I think this study is, you know, more proof that there has been a mentality shift. And there has been uh, this notion that it's a better thing to specialize earlier and earlier. One of the other uh, maybe more minor points, but one that I found really interesting is of all the professional players that they surveyed uh, for this, uh, basically only one in five wanted their kid to specialize in one sport. So, you know, 80% of uh, professional athletes, I think, are, are recognized the benefit of uh, being multi-sport. Kevin mentioned NADA just put out a consensus statement. Uh, a lot of um, additional organizations have as well are uh, the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine, uh, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and also the uh, American Medical uh, Association for Sports Medicine Physicians did too, uh, have all come out with uh, consensus statements in the last uh, handful of years, uh, speaking out against uh, some of the dangers of early sports specialization. I just want to hammer home some of the advantages to specializing late, being a, a multi-sport athlete. So first and foremost, you know, our bodies are built to grow through a variety of uh, activities. It's better to, to cross train. And uh, I think there are some sports that lend itself very well to mix with ice hockey. I'd probably put soccer and lacrosse at the top of that list. Um, let me open this one up to, I guess, I'll ask Kevin and Caruso first. Do you know who the pitcher is in this uh, picture? And then if anyone in the audience uh, wants to know, I, I, I give you a bonus points if you can recognize. No, Caruso's no not dead. No, nothing. How about uh, any of the Minnesotans uh, out there? His dad was a pitcher for the Twins. How about... We got, uh, we got, we got an answer. We got, we got an, an answer there, there Chief. Derek Jeter. Oh, good. Uh, I, I like the thought because uh, he was a multi-sport guy too, but uh, no. I uh, think uh, his main sport that you know him for is actually football. He may or may not have won a Super Bowl last year. He did. It's, uh, it's Pat Mahomes. So Pat Mahomes uh, was a three-sport star in high school. He was, his dad was a former first-round pick of the Minnesota Twins, pitched from Pat Mahomes Sr., um, and he credited a lot of his success as a quarterback uh, to actually playing point guard uh, as a basketball player, because that's what we consider uh, an attacking sport. Uh, and a lot of times if you combine attacking sports like hockey and lacrosse uh, or basketball and football, those skills can blend and actually enhance uh, your reflexes and enable you to see things maybe a little bit faster if uh, you were just doing one sport. So the other thing that I would argue with late specialization, you know, kids that are doing multiple sports, they learn how to learn. Um, and, you know, that is a skill that you can use for the rest of your life. And then as I was growing up and watched the downfall of a lot of single sport athletes, you know, Jennifer Capriati, 
Freddie uh, Adu, Todd Morenovich. You know, I think emotionally, and you know, I am the son of a psychiatrist and have a sister who is a child psychiatrist. I think it is healthy and better to avoid putting all your eggs in one basket super early. Um, and I think that's another reason to be multi-sport. Hey, so, Dave, uh, hey, Doc. Yeah. I just want to join in with a, a question here that came in that kind of goes along with just what we've been talking about um, with this message of, you know, we talked about the NFL draft stats at the beginning of this. We just talked about Pat Mahomes and, you know, there's countless other examples of, you know, athletes at the highest level who didn't specialize early. Um, so the, the viewer wrote in, uh, Dave Winfield never specialized until Major League Baseball. He was drafted in three sports, yeah. football, baseball, and basketball. And he says he probably could have played professional ice hockey too. But why don't you think these examples are making it to the parents and youth sports enthusiasts? Where, where do you think that message is getting blocked? And yeah. why isn't it being like listened to or heard? Um, that's a great question. I think it's a slightly complicated uh, answer. I think there is a lot of misconception at the parent and coaching level. Um, I think they uh, don't have all this information necessarily. And sometimes it takes a star like uh, Pat Mahomes to really open people's uh, eyes about things. Because I think the dangers about early sports specialization just gets back to a lot of that intuitive kind of thinking. It's like, all right, um, if I'm going to be better at something, I just need to do more of it. it. The problem is, is it's a little more complex than that. And kids can only handle so much. You expose their body to injury risk and they're going to burn out. So I think it's, the answer is it's multifactorial. I think we need to do a better job uh, as medical providers, letting parents know the dangers of choosing this route. I think the media could help us out uh, a bit and highlight um, things like that. And I'm going to get into a couple examples actually uh, in a little bit, but that would be my like, uh, I guess, abbreviated answer to that question. Yeah, and I think that kind of goes along. I just actually got off a webinar earlier today um, from the Aspen Institute and Project Play. And one of the panelists on that was a dad who wrote, he actually wrote an article of, you know, the youth sports world and, and craziness of the schedule has come to a halt. And he's thankful for that. And he has yeah. kids that play sports and you know, at first, his kids weren't doing anything at home. They were playing video games. They were connecting with their friends that way. And then all of a sudden, just on their own, they started, you know, doing different athletic activities on their own at home. Um, and it was the first time he'd seen his kids participate in free play and, and do things on their own. And the question was asked to him at the, at the end was, do you think, you know, and he thinks it's a good thing that, you know, kids are able to, you know, kind of explore free play now and find that passion for why they want to do what they're doing instead of being told that this is when you have to practice, this is how much you have to practice. And the question was, you know, knowing what you know now and feeling the way you do after the article he wrote, um, you know, would he go back into that crazy schedule again? And I think this goes to answer that question too, of why, it, why isn't this getting the parents and, and uh, kids is he goes I think that's going to be up to the associations and the leagues of how they bring their sport back because if the leagues are structured that way or an organization is putting on all these tournaments all the time and there's this drive to go to them I think that drives parents to to do that and um, you know more so than they they might even know in their head is the right thing to do so I think that has something to do with it too is what the you know and that's again you know, hopefully some of those people will take some of that into consideration as we're coming out of this. Yeah, yeah I agree. I think that's really well said. Um, so we talked a little bit about literature examples and people always like tangible examples that they can go, oh, like Pat Mahomes. So uh, I was lucky enough to be the team physician for the 2018 men's world team and had a chance to interact with a bunch of the guys. And because this is an area of interest for me, you know, I asked uh, a bunch of these guys uh, what their experiences were, and I, I want to share uh, a couple of them with you. So Anders Lee's from my hometown uh, in Minnesota. He was a three-sport star. Uh, some people don't know he was actually the Gatorade Player of the Year uh, in football. He was a quarterback for the Hornets. He was also a pitcher and a third baseman. 
Um, he was also an All-State hockey player. Obviously took his talents to Notre Dame and is currently the captain of the Islanders and enjoying a wonderful professional career. Um, Chris Kreider, uh, also a multi-sport guy, um, was a pretty talented soccer uh, and lacrosse player as well at uh, Phillips Andover before you know going to Boston College and now he's the captain of the New York Rangers. Uh, Blake Coleman was another one and you know I, I try to pick guys from different spots of the country on the team to highlight you know he was from Dallas he sounds like um, played just about everything uh, before sort of settling on hockey and he didn't make that switch until uh, he was 15 years of age so sometimes people like good hockey examples of uh, you know going down the multi-sport path and having it work out well. I think the really important part of this webinar for me is trying to spread this message to parents and, and coaches out there. And, and it's really important to understand that you guys can all make a difference. You know, I've always loved this uh, quote, you know, your child's success or lack of success in sports does not indicate what kind of parent you are, but having an athlete that is coachable, respectful, a great team, met, met, mentally tough, resilient, and tries their best is a direct reflection of your parenting. So again, this has been a, an area of interest for us at Columbia. We did a study looking at athletes' parents going like, uh, what's going on here? What can we learn uh, about this? And we learned a lot. Uh, more than half of the parents that we surveyed in this study had encouraged their kids to specialize in one sport and 60% of them. And again, we live in a, you know, the tri-state area is very competitive. Um, you know, 60% of the parents that we spoke to uh, expected their child to play their sport uh, in college. And then the second part of this study was just trying to identify factors that were driving these young athletes to specialize. And this is a slightly biased study because all the patients that we recruited for this were our own patients that were seeing us for an orthopedic problem. So again, when you specialize earlier and earlier, you're gonna get injuries. And of these 235 kids that I saw in the office, they were specialized, their average age to specialize in a sport was eight. That's correct, like eight. 70% uh, of these kids wanted to play college or professionally. And the highlight here is to grab the coaches. 33% of the kids that we grabbed in this study were pressured by their coach to specialize in one sport. So that's hey why doc, I yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chime in on that, that third too, because again, um, this goes with one of the questions that came in as well. And we can talk about this now. Um, you know, a third of the athletes being pressured by coaches to specialize in one sport and you know, I was an athletic trainer at the high school level for 15 years. And, you know, I saw that, you know, from my first year through my last year, I noticed less and less familiar faces as we talked about before we got on the air here, um, you know, from one sports season to the next as, as time went on. And, you know, we had a kid who was our starting quarterback in football. He was also a really good pitcher in baseball. And he was basically told by his baseball coach that, you know, if you, if you want to play football, then you're not going to be a pitcher on my team. You have to play with me year round and fall ball and winter ball inside and everything like that. And um, so there was that pressure from the coach and um, Larry Roca, who's been involved in our coaching education program for a long time, he, he wrote in, do you think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing some of this is that, is that um, pressure from those coaches that have these year round type of things in one sport, even though they may not be, you know, it might just be indoor skills or indoor pitching or batting or whatever it may be, um, that that's part of the problem. Uh, I do think it's part of the problem. I think it's one of um, many things that are contributing uh, to this issue. I think a lot of it isn't out of a bad place. You know, I think it gets back to that thought with, uh, you know, the competitive advantage to just put all your eggs in one basket and just, you know, be a specialist uh, early. And the more and more we can get the information out that, you know, that's not necessary to get a college scholarship. It's not necessary to reach, you know, the elite achievement in a sport. Uh, there are a lot of benefits to playing multiple uh, sports, being willing to learn, build on that uh, skill set. So uh, I think one of the big things that we've got to get out there is trying to debunk that myth that, you know, you got to put all your eggs in the basket early. And I think coaches, parents, and to you know, some degree, the medical community has been, um, you know, guilty of sitting silent on that as well. 
Yeah, so I wanted to just really highlight that. I mean, that that kind of blew me uh, away. So I'm going to open this up again because this is sort of my final uh, point that I, I think is important and that I want everyone to kind of be thinking maybe a little out of the box or differently. So I guess I'm going to ask Kevin first and Dave because you guys are on and I can see uh, who won the most medals in the 2018 Olympics. I'm not going to answer this just because I looked through your presentation oh. before this. So All right, so then how about, we, how about Caruso? Don't, don't look at my slide because I think it, it mentions it there somewhere, but uh, did, what, what was your initial instinct answer? Norway. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's correct. Yeah, but, but uh, I watched the HBO special. You so. watched the HBO special. Yeah, and if, and if you haven't watched the HBO special, there's a, a great special on Norway and what they are doing with their youth sports over there. And it's interesting. It's probably – 30 minutes long or something like that. Yeah. But um, just really interesting what they're doing over in Norway. Sorry, go ahead. No, it's a, that's a perfect uh, intro. I, um, you know, Norway. Well, how about this? I can ask a question. Uh, do you know what the population of Norway is? From the no, special, really. they didn't tell you? So it, it's not even 6 million people. Not like our country, US population, last I looked before this webinar was 330 million. So like, that, that's kind of crazy that a country that doesn't even have 6 million people essentially won the last winter Olympics. And I, I think there should be uh, some take home messages from the Norwegian success. So their youth sports culture is the polar opposite of ours. Instead of early sports specialization, most of their sports there, they don't even keep score, give a grade if you're an individual sport until you're 13. There are no travel teams. There are no elite teams until they get into the high school age. And for a country of less than 6 million people, they're boasting greater than a 90% youth sports participation rate. Um, like, wow, wow, and wow. And I'm, I'm as patriotic as the next person. I love our country. I'm not advocating that we become Norway. However, I think there are some important, you know, takeaways here. I mean, they just crushed the last Winter Olympics. Yes, Dave. So uh, by score, they don't keep standing. So within the game, they actually keep score. The kids know, but they're, they're not keeping that score or posting it or um, defining where players rank in there just wanted we, we have a, a norwegian coach or ah. that's talking to us on youtube so fair enough well i i don't want to uh misspeak uh on that one then but regardless i feel totally different mentality they are not embracing the ricky bobby if you're not first you're last they're trying to be inclusive and i think the other really neat thing about this culturally is you're maybe catching a couple of those kids that would be late bloomers that maybe initially you know, we're uh, kind of uh, out in the weeds or looking up and not really paying attention and then kind of came into their own later. Um, you know, with that, we're talking about that sometimes creating the, uh, that secondary barrier to sports participation. So uh, listen, uh, I wanna close with some takeaway pearls. So listen, early sports specialization is absolutely associated with increased injury risk. Uh, it is absolutely a risk factor for burnout and can lower uh, lifelong participation in a sport like ice hockey. Um, early sports specialization is not required to achieve elite status in ice hockey. And I, I went over two papers within the last two years that have shown that. I really think with making a difference, like this is the kind of webinar we need to be on to get the message out to coaches and parents that, um, you know, listen, these kids are following suit from what they hear from you. Um, you are going to influence uh, their decision to specialize in a sport. You know, if you had to do a takeaway number from this, 14, just remember 14 or high school or Bantam, however, um, that's going to be my takeaway pearl. And I thought this was a, a really good video. Uh, I took this when I was over in Denmark. Uh, obviously, a tremendous amount of skill here uh, to get this done. And Johnny Hockey adds a little uh, soccer twist here at the end, which I, I thought was really uh, neat and appropriate for this talk. Wait for it. Wait for it. Hey, with the soccer boot, ole. Um, so just continuing, you know, the topic uh, was, you know, timing is everything. Uh, you know, youth sports are supposed to be about free play, fun, social development. Let's keep uh, sports fun. And uh, takeaway message here is 14. So just a little parting quote. 
when your child is done with sports and the glory days are over, what's going to be left? Will it be more than trophies, news clippings? Hopefully it'll be a foundation of strong character that will keep growing as he or she does. Just let them play. It's supposed to be fun. Uh, these are some resources that you guys can use if uh, you want some additional information. Uh, almost all the major medical uh, groups have come up with a consensus uh, statement. And then I'd like to just highlight uh, two books. One is Why Johnny Hates Sports by Fred Eng. And then the other one, it's wonderful. It's actually available on the internet. It was a, a guy who wrote his thesis at Baylor. His name's Jordan Cox. It's called The Professionalization of Youth Sports. It's a, it's a really quick and it's a really, really good read. And he was clearly ahead of his time about 10 years ago. So uh, thank you. I'm happy to take questions, comments. There's my email, uh, my Twitter handle, and um, that's what I had to share. All right, Doc, I think that that's awesome. Thanks for all that info. And just to kind of tie in a couple of your last slides for people that are viewing, I know um, a lot of that last slide, some of you said about fun, um, physical, social development, all that kind of stuff that sports should build. Um, you know, that goes into some webinars that we have had um, on number one, on the fun aspect uh, with Dr. Amanda Visick and all these are and Dave can correct me if I'm wrong, they're on our YouTube, USA Hockey YouTube channel that you can go back and watch. And I think if, for people who missed that, um, that was an awesome webinar, um, looking at how you know, to make sports fun. And I think one of the big takeaways for me out of that, um, and not just the only one, but you know, they ask kids of, of different ages growing up and different ability levels of what they think is fun and they mapped all of these 81 or 82 characteristics that kids came up with that were fun. And winning was down in the mid 40s, I believe, in their, um, where, when they rank those. So again, I think that's a great message and that's a great webinar to go back and look into. And also on the you know, physical and social development and that ties into uh, Dr. Dean Kreiler's uh, did a webinar on physical literacy and he has another webinar coming up I believe next week um, just to kind of push that a little bit moving forward but I think that all I think all of this stuff kind of ties together a little bit when you put them all into perspective um, you, you're do at, at the forefront I think it's doing what's best for kids in in the youth sports world um, so a couple of things I'm going to tie in with some of the things writers came in um, so you know, there's some parents out there that define success as their kid getting a scholar, college scholarship, trophies, et cetera. Um, and number one, do you think the increased cost of college is driving parents to try to rely on scholarships more? And with that being the case, and sometimes is that pushing some of these leagues to push this message to get kids to play? more of their sport throughout the year does that did I kind of tie that together right did that make sense yeah to you? I think I uh, I think I understand the gist of that question um, it's a good question uh, tough question um, certainly I think finances are driving uh, a lot of this I imagine if you've got a, a young kid uh, that wants to be a college hockey player uh, if you add up probably all the years of tournaments and things uh, I'm sure that that's going to be quite the hefty uh, number to just sort of uh, get up there. I think there's probably some truth to that. Maybe there's some parents that are looking at that as their, you know, ticket out. But, um, you know, I did put up that slide with the, I guess, percentage chance of jumping from uh, high school and playing college hockey. So for every 10 high school hockey players, nine aren't going to play uh, in college. So I don't know if that's the safest financial uh, bet to be uh, making, I guess. And then you know, maybe the other thing that's tying in with a lot of this in the year round hockey, you know, is uh, just a little bit of the current culture, you know, rinks are a financial entity as well. And if they sit empty in the summer, then, um, you know, uh, they're not making money uh, either. So there's uh, certainly a financial aspect uh, that is driving some of this year round sports activity. Yeah, and I think, like you said, I think that's great. That's not a, uh, you know, don't rely on a scholarship for your college money. That's kind of like, you know, me buying my lottery ticket and hoping that's going to be my retirement account. It's, I mean, uh, listen, I'm, I've prided most of my life on being a positive person. I wouldn't, you know, tell someone, um, 
no, like that's a dumb or a stupid uh, idea. I, don't, I, I just, I think it's, when you look at the numbers, it's probably just not the, the smart play, but um, you know, it's, these are challenging uh, times as we try to navigate what's exactly the right formula to try to get that college scholarship that gets back to, you know, the skill uh, argument and the competitive advantage. And you kind of can sometimes feel like you're going in circles. So I understand a lot of times why parents and coaches, you know, frustrate or get frustrated and um, uh, have uh, a lot of stress with regards to this uh, issue. Right. Um, just a couple of things here I have to add in uh, for those of you who want to look into the, um, the Norwegian way, there's a link. Um, to that in the chat, if you want to look at that and uh, copy that down. Um, also, I want to I want to clarify that last point on your presentation that's up on the screen right now. Sure. Um, so when you say and the right time to specialize is around fourteen years. That and by that, I think we mean that's the earliest age you should start specializing, not yeah. the age you have to specialize. No, uh, that is a good point. I think when we're looking at this, um, I wish there were just like one number. The When we look at, I guess, the literature uh, anecdotal and put it all together, like listen, if you want to be a college hockey player, if you want to be a professional hockey player, the time is going to come where you're going to have to specialize. And the earliest age you should consider doing that is the Bantam age at 14, somewhere between 14 and 15 would be the earliest time where uh, I don't think you're going to cause harm. So, so Dr. Popkin, you might, yeah. we might have some parents or some other people that say the kid, my kid only wants to play hockey and yeah. only want, you know, like, how would you answer, answer that with the numbers or how, how would you answer that? No, I, I think when I've, you know, spent many hours thinking about this uh, topic, I think what's most important, you know, when people try to identify, you know, what makes somebody elite, how do you acquire skill? at the end of the day, there is something about intrinsic drive that no number of hours or, you know, can substitute for. So if that kid is like, I just love hockey, all I want to do is hockey. Okay, but make sure then that three or four months a year, they're not doing hockey so that they don't burn out. I just, I'd hate to see us uh, lose some talented uh, kids because they just, uh, their, uh, their whole identity is so wrapped up uh, in the sport. Uh, I think it just really sets them up to not only, you know, if they have some type of uh, setback where they don't make that next team, um, they feel like not only are they letting themselves down, but their parents down. And um, I think that that can uh, quickly spiral uh, into leading the kids to quit and not play the sport anymore. Hey, Doc, I got, um, you know, from my aspect from, you know, as an athletic trainer, um, and I work with some of our youth development camps, um, during the summer and also with one of our select teams still. Um, but, you know, you look at, you know, the amount of time that some kids may be putting into a sport and especially ice hockey and one of the injuries that, and I think this, I, I've seen it even as a high school athletic trainer prior to this, um, you know, one of the um, injuries that we're seeing more and more, and I'm sure that you are too um, with your orthopedic practice is, is hip impingement. And yeah. are you seeing, um, you know, is, is that something that's a new thing? Is it something that we have a greater awareness of in the medical field of, of actually diagnosing what's causing that hip pain? And, you know, can you relate that to, you know, you know, should there be, um, you know, I've heard people talk about, you know, especially with goaltenders in ice hockey, I think is, is the biggest, you know, you see it in skaters as well, but, um, you know, we look at putting players on pitch counts. Is there anything to, to look at as far as time that you're doing in the sport with, you know, going up and down into a butterfly and all the movement and the, and the repetitions of that? And, you know, can you just speak to that a little bit? Sure. Uh, that's a great and insightful question. And it does relate a lot to youth sports. So the current thinking, yes, uh, goalies, particularly butterfly goalies, although no one's looked at the study butterfly versus more standard versus a hybrid technique for which is actually worse. Uh, but getting into those type of positions is putting a lot of stress on the growing hip. And similar to say a condition of the knee, like uh, you may be familiar with something called Osgood Schlatter, which is like an overuse injury of the tibial tubercle, which is just a spot on the knee where the patellar tendon is inserting that's what we call an apophysis. It's a type of growth plate, but not one that makes your bone longer. It's the junction for where a tendon goes into the bone. And uh, in a lot of hockey players, particularly with the hip, 
we sort of think that that repetitive uh, injury is stretching that physis uh, up around the hip and is causing hip impingement. And um, studies are certainly coming out that femoral acetabular impingement and the labral tears uh, have a high association with hockey players and particularly goalies. So yes, I think that's one of the things when we say, you know, if you're pushing the envelope and just playing hockey, 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 um, yeah, I, I think that you're probably setting yourself up to potentially have some hip issues. I, I know on the, the goalie side of it, we always try to tell our goalies and goalie parents to be, be off their goalie equipment for six weeks or five, five weeks, which I think is important. But I think there's also the aspect that I've heard and read about, about their standard T push and pushing to stop. It brings so much torque on their body too, I think. You know, it's not just the butterflies and the RVH, VH, and all that goalie talk, but I think it's it's a combination of all that stuff. So, but do you think there should be like a butterfly count on these goalies? How do how would you like? When would be a good age? You know, like that's the tough thing. It it is. I mean, um, I, I think that that area is probably vulnerable. Um, maybe starting at nine or ten to maybe 14 or, or 15 um, that probably closes down somewhere in that uh, range. I think it'd be, you know, it's an interesting idea to correlate that with like a pitch count for, for baseball. But uh, I think the problem with that is I don't think we have enough data to give meaningful uh, restrictions uh, yet on that. I, I know there's a couple other hockey physicians that are, are certainly looking into that uh, topic area. So maybe as they've developed a pitch count in baseball, that's something we can look forward to on the prevention side in ice hockey. It's a great suggestion. And, and then on the coach side of that, you can, you know, as a coach, and if you're out there, you can also just tell the goalie, hey, goalie, we want you to stand up and watch the puck or work on your position. And so those are easy things that you can do if you sense your goalie is going down or staying down and, um, a good thing to do on maybe different stations that you have your goalies and it's not going to look like they are um, not trying but they can focus on their positioning or they could focus on um, getting the spots earlier so that's what we try to talk to the goalie coaches and and the coaches about so. yeah and I think Dave too and you can correct me if I'm wrong from some of the stuff I've heard and Dr. Popkin you can chime in too I think you know that kind of you know one of the prevention techniques to keep you know without an actual count of uh, when you're going up down you know when you get on these teams of you know 9 10 11 12 years old and you know really the 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 concept of splitting time with goalies and not just riding one goalie all the time like give you know if you have multiple goalies make sure that they're getting equal playing time so they not only develop the right way but also that in you know a secondary benefit of that could be the the prevention of these types of injuries at that vulnerable age yeah, I know of three goalies in the NHL currently that did not start playing goalie full time until they were 12 or 13. So these are current NHLers that, you know, when they started, they became great athletes, but they're also, you know, learning position and learning, um, learning different positions. And we were speaking to a coach uh, the other day and, uh, you know, he had, he, he was coaching a 12 U team. He's like, we only started this year to have a couple goalies that were kind of full time. But in years past, they, they just rotated everybody through the stuff, so which is very interesting. And, you know, I've heard of high school teams even switching goalies uh, halfway through the game and championship games and all of that. You know, like it doesn't matter. They're, they're in, they're out. You know, uh, I think that could also bring, you know, we talked to Brian Gallivan a couple of days ago from the NTDP and the stress levels that these goalies are put through um, that I think he's we're trying to do more research on that, not just physically, but mentally and um, emotionally type stuff. So just interesting stuff of how different they are to regular players and how they, their bodies and mechanics. So. Well, um, we're coming up on our hour here and I think we got to, you know, all of our questions that came in in the queue. Um, actually, I think, Oh, there's one more. Let's just, okay. So one of the points that you made was hockey is a late developing sport. Can you expand on that as it relates to sports specialization? Oh, sure. Uh, I'm actually surprised I didn't get the question. Uh, usually when I give a talk like this, someone raises their hand very early and says, well, does that apply to all sports? And there are what we call early entry sports. So like figure skating or gymnastics, where if you don't specialize earlier than 12, um, 
you're going to miss the curve. Uh, so what I meant by a late specialization sport um, is uh, it's not an early barrier to entry. But with regards to ice hockey, still like a little different than football. Like if you don't learn to skate at a, a young age, I certainly think you're going to be at a disadvantage. Whereas say a sport like football, that really is truly a late sport. Some of the best football players never played football until the end of high school. Okay, great. I, I really like the point earlier, um, you know, about playing multiple sports. And uh, we've I've seen stuff about having donor sports and kind of talking about, you know, playing lacrosse or playing soccer for ice hockey, which I think yeah. is super important. Um, you know, what, what, ha, there, there's a book out called The Athletic Skills Model that was pretty interesting from a person in the Netherlands. And they were talking about having donor sports, whether it's these type of sports or trying to find that within their, their sport for ice hockey or for other sports. They're even talking about parkour, which is, I think, um, for people <laughs> that don't know parkour, it's, you know, uh, the office did a little skit on that about um, going everywhere and over stuff. So, but I think that's just a super important thing to make sure that we are very varied in, in our development for our, our players and our kids and uh, making sure that. Uh, so Dodge Popkin, what we've been doing with all our guests is we ask a, a young Dr. Charles Popkin, any advice that you would give this, your young, a young Dr. Charles Popkin right now um, throughout your time? Oh, like if I could, wait, like, so the question is, if I could go back in time to a younger version of myself, like when I was a kid playing, would I do anything different? Is that uh, you, you could do a kid or you could probably do uh, maybe when you're just out of college. Oh, man. All right. Uh, <clears throat> that's a good one. Uh, well, I got to tell you, after I, I feel like I've lived a pretty charmed life uh, <laughs> pretty much the whole way through. I don't know if I do. Uh, a whole lot different. I come with a great family. I love my time in college. Uh, right after college, I got to live for a year down in Miami before going to med school. Um, I, I guess maybe the only thing I would say is uh, just make a little more time for friends and family. Um, and I'd love to go to a couple more hockey games with my dad. Okay, cool. Uh, Kevin, um, thank you very much. Dr. Popkin. Uh, Kevin, do you have anything else you want to end with before we, we sign off here? No, I just want to, you know, thank everyone for being on and, um, you know, and Dr. Popkin for all that great information and, you know, just hope everyone's staying safe and well during these times and, you know, you know, having fun with doing the activities they could do at home with the, with the stay at home guidelines. And as we phase out of these things and, you know, um, eventually we're going to get back to sports. And I think this is great information, especially at this downtime to, you know, kind of reevaluate maybe how we look at things um, coming out of the back end of the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that we're in right now. So again, thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Hope to see you at the rink soon. Yeah. Thank you everybody. Tomorrow we have uh, Jeremy Swayman uh, who recently signed with the Boston Bruins. He's on at three 30. And then on Friday we have gold medal winning athletes, uh, a couple of our athletes from different uh, years, 1980, 2018 women's and then 2014, 2018 sled. So, exciting week and then for next week we'll give you a sneak peek we got kind of going off of what uh dr popkin and kevin was talking about uh we have a, a, a we got a game for this on tuesday with Stuart armstrong on wednesday dr dean Creelars is back on he's going to be talking more of the practical side about how um to incorporate you know our athletes and to improve their physical literacy and then on friday we have uh seth appert our national team development coach He's going to talk about practicing at the NTDP. So kind of really specific to, to different age groups. And uh, I think you you get a lot of for next week. So looking forward. Thank you again, Dr. Popkin, Kevin. And we'll see you uh, tomorrow at 3.30. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Nice.